Well, warm Pacific greetings to April Heinrichs. Welcome to the OFC Coaches Conference 2023. Uh, now, before we get started, I understand you want to share a video with all of us, um, which I'm really looking forward to, to seeing. Yeah, um, nothing like an inspirational video to get us started today. Here we go. I remember that video being shared on social media. I, I shared it around my friend group and I thought, what a really clever piece of marketing in terms of the Women's World Cup and an amazing evolution to see where women's football is positioned now. It is. And, you know, I saw it cold, kind of like you just saw it. Um, and maybe some of the viewers are just looking at it for the first time. And it, it tricked me. It, it tripped me up as well because I thought those were clips of men. And um, it is the single best advertisement. And, you know, we Americans have a lot of advertisements, you know. It's the single uh, most influential and clever advertisement I've ever seen in women's football because it exposes our bias. Our bias is that, um, you know, if it's a side volley or a header from distance or some sort of a um, an amazing – uh, football action in the box we we think it's men but actually these are all clips of women so um what a great way to start us today huh with us uh, challenging our biases totally and 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 i i fell right into that trap the first time i saw it i did i believed i was watching the french men's team and i thought i i don't remember seeing these highlights before i don't remember seeing these international matches and it was only yeah you're right afterwards i thought to myself wow yeah, I've got a really preconceived notion about what maybe I think women's football is. And, uh, you know, I think, and I know you're going to talk about it later on, I think this recently held FIFA Women's World Cup in New Zealand and Australia really did a, a fantastic job of setting that up. Yeah, they did. It was an amazing World Cup. And, you know, I think about the, the video and it reminds me, people have, for 35, 40 years, people have asked me, um, What's the difference between men's and women's football? And we Americans try not to compare or, and um, combat the two against each other. We're very supportive of our men's programs, um, our men's teams, our um, football in America. And we know that if both of us are supportive, we, we both get better. So, uh, But the video does make you stop and think. And I challenge people listening right now. If you're watching a TV with football on it from a distance, you cannot tell the difference between men and women. You can't. The game is being played um, pretty beautifully. Now, if you sit there and really analyze it, yes, the men can still strike the ball further. Um, I might add the men's game has a little more drama in it. Uh, <laughs> a little rolling around on the ground more than in the women's game. But otherwise, from a distance on the television, it's a very similar game. So, um, all right. Well, where are we going to start here, April? How we, uh, yeah. Before we maybe introduce you to the rest of the group, I, I, I understand we've got an evolution or a timeline of, of uh, the game itself? Yeah, so let's start with, I put together a timeline 
of men's football and you know i'm including the first ever ofc championships and the 10 editions that have followed you can see that men's football the first men's world cup was in the 1930s but men's football started in the, in the 1800s and so you know there are a solid 80 to 100 years in front of us the first under 17 world cup was in 1985 for men's football and the first euros and then the reason I share this is, again, not to compare men's football to women or pit men against women, but really to show and remind people that are judging women harshly and judging women's coaches is we've not been playing the game as long. We, we are 80 to 100 years behind the men's game in terms of our touches on the ball, in terms of our professionalism, our opportunities, our competitions. First women's Euros was and same year as the OFC. You see here in 1983. First Women's World Cup, I played in that one, 1991. And then the first under 17 World Cup held in New Zealand, by the way. Um, and we've only had seven editions of the under 17 World Cup um, on the women's side. And the men's side, they're, they're getting ready to play their 18th or 19th competition, I believe. So um, when we watch the game, let's remember the women have been playing it for uh, far fewer years, which translates into um fewer touches as i mentioned less professionalism less there's no academies under a lot of clubs we have women's teams but we don't have the academy built underneath of it we don't have um, professionalism a lot of parts of the the world women still don't have the opportunity to play so in terms of our evolution we're only just getting started and i think a good it's a good time for us to reflect on the 2023 fifa women's world cup held in australia and new zealand it's it's uh, amazing to actually see the visual representation and for it to be put in such a succinct way. And I think you personally are really well positioned, having played in that first Women's World Cup in 1991, all the way through to where we are present day. It's going to be a fascinating presentation. Super. Well, I have a photo. There I am 32 years and probably 32 pounds ago, um, <laughs> holding the first ever Women's World Cup trophy. And you know, I have attended most of the Women's World Cups. I think the only one I missed was in China in 2007. In some capacity, either technical as a player, uh, t technical for U.S. soccer, or for FIFA. So it's been a pleasure of a lifetime, to be honest. So, Seamus, let me tell you my story a little bit. Feel free to interrupt any time. Um, it's, it's weird that I'm telling you my story, but um, I think an individual story can sometimes feel uh, personal for somebody that's maybe listening and um, I also want to show you through my story how much I've gotten back from the game so a little bit about my journey there I am little round as my parents called it I had a round soccer ball head even when I was young um, I threw soccer or football um, as we call it in some countries I was able to go to college uh, without uh, without soccer, I would not have been able to attend college. My family was rather uh, under-resourced for that. So I went to college and played there four years and got my college education, um, which I was the first one in my family to do so. So through soccer, through football, we can often get things we don't really expect or even value at the time. But um, I was able to go to one of the best universities, University of North Carolina, uh, one of the top universities in the U.S. and get my four-year education. I uh, Many years later, I went on to do an executive master's as well through, again, through my football connections. Um, this is a tweet when you, that came out from FIFA or from U.S. soccer. And uh, yeah, when, when you've been around a little bit like I have, you start to say, oh, I kind of wish kind of wish U.S. soccer and FIFA wouldn't wouldn't tweet my birth year <laughs> uh, but it is the gift that keeps on giving uh, whoever is doing this behind the scenes they're honoring the 1991 women's world cup team um, that that my birth year my birthday is being tweeted out by them with again a photo from from uh, 1991 and yes I wore the number two my entire career but I was actually a, a forward so uh, uh, trying to score goals. That's another photo of the first ever Women's World Cup. Uh, that was our qualifying photo in Haiti. Um, first ever uh, World Cup qualifying 
and um, yeah, we, we won all of our games and we started to come together and start to believe in ourselves. So, um, and then on the right, another gift that keeps on giving. I don't, I don't know, Seamus, if you can see it on the bottom. Yeah. Uh, so this is the FIFA Museum. They called me about 10 years ago, eh, maybe less, and said, April, do you have your jersey? Yes. Do you have your medal? Yes. Would you be able to donate it to FIFA Museum? And I was like, um, me? You want me to give you my jersey to the FIFA Museum? Absolutely. So this jersey, this uniform sits with the trophy along with my captain's armband um, in the FIFA Museum. And, uh, yeah. April, I've been lucky enough to visit and I've seen that in, in person. Oh, it's, it's an right. incredible testament uh, to the longevity of your of your career. I do want to pause for a moment and just ask a question, reflect back on those early years. And how important was it to you to have a supportive family to encourage you to pursue sports? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we're talking about more than 40, 40 years ago, right? Um, I don't think it was in um, planned. It, Certainly my parents were not coached up, but literally when I played every sport, I played um, soccer, I played basketball, I ran track and I played softball. I played baseball in the park with the boys. Um, never at any time did anyone make me feel like I couldn't, shouldn't, or why. Um, especially my father, I give him a little credit for just playing catch with me in the backyard, shooting hoops with me uh, on the basketball rim and encouraging me in track and and he didn't know anything about soccer, <laughs> but um, I give I give him credit for dumping me off, uh, shuttling me all over the place, supporting me, um, and never making me feel like it was something wrong with what I was doing or different. Why would he? Of course, he supported me the way he would um, any of his children. I I think so. Um, I think it's an important piece of parenting that grow up. It's kids don't come out of the womb. Um, feeling discriminated against or judged, they learn it. And if you have great parents um, that are supportive, then I think that's a, a good launching pad for your career. And what lessons did sport teach you as a person uh, in those formative years, in those early years before you reached the international stage? Mm. Well, I'm told, and I've since learned and have come to accept it, but love it, is that I'm the most competitive person anyone's ever met. Of course, that's from my sphere of people that I know, but um, I think competitiveness, we do have to teach women, most women, how to compete and give them permission. We say permission to com compete. And my college coach, who went on to be the national team coach, was the one that uh, Un unleashed us, so to speak. I was unleashed before I ever went to North Carolina in terms of my competitive spirit. But competitiveness is not a male trait. Competitiveness is not a trait to be shunned. I always tell people, let's not confuse bad sporting behavior with being too competitive. When I hear that, it just makes me jump. And I, I almost always jump in. No, 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 no. Bad sporting behavior is not to be confused with competitiveness. Competitiveness is competitiveness. And I've also seen um, some of my friends who never played sports are very competitive. They're competitive with themselves. They're competitive in the workplace. They want to do well and they work hard. So um, I think competitiveness is probably my trait in which I'm written about often or spoken about. I think um, perseverance, um, we call it grit determination for your long-term goals over time in the, in the face of being disappointed in the face of not getting po positive feedback or any feedback, that gritty determination I had um, and work ethic. I mean, those are like the three things that um, powered me, if you will, to um, want more, to achieve more, to have success, and to even when I fail, to get up again and go again. I think sports an incredible teacher in terms of instilling those values of um, within uh, young people. But please continue with the, uh, okay. your journey. Yeah, we'll be here all day if I don't. So um, through football, through soccer, I've also worked for these three amazing uh, governing bodies. So I've been a, a consultant for FIFA since 2005. So that's going on 18 years on, on a variety of projects. 
currently working on uh, the, the TDS or technical study, uh, not technical study group. Um, that's, that's the former role I had, but uh, the TDS is the talent development scheme. I've also worked on a number of occasions for U.S. soccer, from being the under-16 coach to being the under-18 coach to being the head coach um, of our U.S. women's national team. But also two times I was the technical director leading our, our vision, our philosophy across multiple age groups. And in between, I worked for the U.S. Olympic Committee, and I worked for uh, 17 different sports in my portfolio. And that was really challenging. And... Uh, was another great growth spurt for me because you're working with different sports, not just football where I'm comfortable. And I worked with men's sports and women's sports and um, team sports and technical sports. So uh, I find that work at the Olympic Committee has really helped me with the current project I'm on with FIFA because I'm going to countries in FIFA right now in the FIFA world and talking to uh, the leaders in countries about their men's and women's football, boys and girls football. So again, a little girl from Colorado who had uh, no family member go to college, who had no formal education, uh, higher education through football. I've been able to travel the world, work for amazing uh, governing bodies, work with amazing partners uh, in USA basketball, US soccer, um, USA volleyball, beach volleyball, and many of the countries in, in the football movement in Oceania. And, um, Africa and a Europe and Asia, so I feel pretty blessed. Um, well, it's, it's, it's an incredible story of success, and it just goes to show the power of football as well, that you can achieve amazing things from anywhere, no matter what your background is. So it's a truly inspirational uh, piece yeah. of work, body of work that you've put together over the years. And what you don't see in here, Seamus, is all the countries I've been to, all the friends I've been to, all the informal education I've had because I needed it. Uh, all the opportunities, but also all the young people that I, I've uh, come in contact with, who one of the things I say to them every time I see them playing is, you know, I'm, I'm always watching. So if I bump into a former player that I coached, she knows that I've always been watching her and supporting her. It's amazing. All right. Let's move on. Let's talk about the Women's World Cup, shall we? Yes, please. I was lucky enough to take in some matches here in Aotearoa, New Zealand. It absolutely caught fire. So I'm really looking forward to hearing your thoughts on this uh, wonderful event. Yeah, I had a dual role. Uh, I was a travel guide for all my friends and family that came in from the U.S. So we went to uh, many of the games here in, in um, New Zealand. And uh, we also had a workshop. FIFA held a workshop down in Wellington around two of the games, and I was invited to the women's conference at the end for the women's World Cup final in Sydney. So, um, yeah, I was blessed. So let's talk about some of the, the things, and uh, happy to hear any of your reactions. Yeah. I love this photo. You've got, right for the first time in women's football, co-hosts, um, Australia and New Zealand, two very different countries, two very different teams in their in their evolution. Uh and yet um, both countries put on an amazing, their part of the World Cup. You know, it wasn't like Australia overshadowed um, New Zealand in some ways, it wasn't. Um, it was more like there was two, there was two, uh, one World Cup going on in two different countries, different days, different, every other day we're watching a game that was just brilliant. And uh, we can see here from this one, Sam Kerr, uh, we waited and waited and waited for her to get on the field consistently, and then she delivered with a brilliant, with a brilliant goal and a key moment. But you can see the number seventy five thousand people. Incredible. Uh, at at uh, some of the games in Australia, I'll share another one for you. There's a lot of numbers on this, right? This is specific to Australia. What stood out to me, because you know, here's the attendance; it's lower than the previous slide. But what stood out to me is this. Uh, every Australian will tell you that they have women's football was the number one rated uh, television show in the history of Australia, including sports, arts, other sports, men's sports, comedy show, whatever. It was the number one program of the of the year in, in uh, so far. It's amazing. It's amazing. Yep. It really, it really is. It. it uh... I think it eclipsed everybody's expectations, but I know for people that were in the know, it wasn't such a surprise because the snowball had been building. Yes, and you never know, 
right? <laughs> because true. if it rained, uh, if it rained in New Zealand as hard as it had been, uh, might the fans come out? Well, we hope so. Um, one thing we never do in women's football is take anything for granted. So uh, the fact that uh, Australia had such amazing attendance numbers and such support, and I'm sure if you were at some of these games, you saw the walk up to the stadiums were amazing. Um, the fan support in bars and restaurants and on the on the airplane. Um, I remember seeing a, a tweet of all the people on an airplane watching the Matildas play in extra time. So pretty amazing. Historical, they made it to the semifinals. It's the first time ever for them. Um, and, you know, some of those images of the Aussies and their goals that they scored were just fantastic. So I know for this region, although Australia doesn't play in Oceania anymore, um, for this region of the world to have the football be played in the time zone down here at the prime time time zone rather than in the middle of the night that's really appreciated to watch uh, Australia have success and I thought this slide right here Seamus really told a great story Emily Von Eggmans uh, a, a player on their team that's played for the Australian team for 10 years this is her a, a personal photo of her first cap for Australia you can see it's nobody in the stands right uh, probably a broken down football. And then on the bottom, here's Emily Von Eggman's, oops. And Emily playing in front of 75,000 at home at a home world cup. So just for her personally, a big difference. It, 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 it really is. I think it's images like that, that really paint the picture of the growth so far. And that previous slide, I remember watching that quarterfinal Australia versus France. I don't think I've ever been gripped by such drama in any sporting event that I've witnessed in my time as well. It was a perfect school, a storm and such an amazing advertisement for sport. We can park women to the side for, for this one. In terms yeah. of sporting drama, it was incredible. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And the what I liked about the Australian way they celebrated is they always ran to the fans, hmm. right? In men's football, some guy rips his uniform, runs to the corner flag and wants the TV all just on him, you know? In women's football, they all ran to each other to the to the goal scorer or to the team and towards the fans. So it was some really amazing images. Okay, so on, and in New Zealand, I thought this was really easy. If you can see in the corner here, these are the New Zealand coaches, but this is the 1-0 upset against Norway in the in the actual World Cup opener. And I was there and it was fantastic. But you know what was really interesting? Yeah, they, they had a great crowd, but look at the bottom here. This yeah. is what the, the CEO of New Zealand football told me later. The 24 hours after that game, the opener of the Women's World Cup, because New Zealand played before Australia, they sold another 100,000 tickets. Phenomenal. Yep. Phenomenal. Yep. And that's great for Oceana, right? Uh, so some more data i'll share with you feel free to react but uh, over the course of all these games nearly two million um people attended games yeah it's it's the again the 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 exponential growth in terms of attendance across the events as they've progressed is is amazing yeah and no, and it and no sign of slowing down right april no, no sign, sign of slowing down and and by the way every game it seemed was a new record every yeah. right like uh new attendance records uh, multiple games and then when you look back we now have all the data that it was a record in overall attendance i think fifa will be happy with this but also this is their ability to give back to the players and give back to the clubs that developed the players that there was a at least as of today an 88 million dollar or 888 million dollar revenue um and and that's the power of football that's the power of FIFA hosting a World Cup and now being able to give some of that money back, which I'll talk to later. Um, if you don't know the context of, say, the World Cup four years ago, I don't know that this number um, can really pop your eyes. But if you just take the number 888 million on its own, that's pretty powerful. Yeah. Not to mention, not to mention April as well, the ancillary revenue from hospitality, from side events as well as, yeah, uh, yeah, phenomenal numbers. 
Yeah, I don't have any of that data yet, and I'm sure it'll start rolling out. I do have some about the euros later I'll share. Mm. So this this stood out to me. You know, it's a lot of information here. I don't expect everyone to read it, but in England's uh, defeat uh, from Spain, there are some attendance records viewing, but at the bottom you can see here that at the time of the broadcast in England, 74% of the people watching television in England were watching the women's game, England versus Spain final. That's a staggering number. 74% of the people watching TV at yeah. that moment of that game were watching the game. Yeah, it stops a nation. It stopped a nation. Yeah, it's a great way of saying it. And then here's some similar data to Spain. 65.7% of those watching in Spain were watching the women's game. And I think it's a tribute. I, I don't have it in here, but to even the extra time that was played in this game, England versus Spain, was higher than 67, 65%. So um, it's a nation. It brings football has the power of bringing nations together, right, to watch the World Cup, men's or women, on, on television at the same moment and watch it in bars and restaurants and in your own, sorry, in your own um, house. And be able to go, you know what, I remember where I was when Spain beat England for the Women's World Cup. And in 20 years, people will tell that story. Well, that's right. And in, in, a, in an era now where appointment viewing is when you want it, the fact that sport is live and as it happens is one of the few real entertainment joys that we have. The drama of not knowing and wanting to be, like you say, uh, built into that national pride, built into that feeling of connection uh, mm -hmm. across things is uh, is really powerful. Wow, I hadn't thought of it like that, Seamus. It's a good point. Sport still brings us together live. Yes. Yes. All right, some quick other data to share with with our uh, our attendees. On the on the left here, you'll see the the amount of money each player will get. From Spain, it's 270,000 U.S. dollars for winning the World Cup. Staggering. I would take 2,700 from 1991 if they would give it to me. <laughs> well, well, t well, well, tell us, April. We are literally, we have literally gone from zero to 270,000, right? Yep. In, in yep. the time that we've we've been here, and even the jump recently to 270,000 is a big jump from four years ago. Yeah. It's a big jump. And even if you look at the bottom there and you see all the teams that qualified for the World Cup, their players will get 30,000. For, for the types of countries that aren't playing in the Champions League and aren't playing in, in first division professional leagues and you know making over 100,000 a year, that $30,000 is going to pay the bills for a long time. It's meaningful. That will keep them from retiring. I retired in 1991 because I was making $10 a day. <laughs> long time ago I know and I have no regrets I wouldn't change my era but it, it'll keep young players from retiring at 22 23 24 years of age so it's really meaningful that FIFA's given that money and it's validation as well right it's validation for uh, the effort and the, um, the the hard work and dedication that's gone in to get to that stage yeah yeah for sure and it's validation it's appreciated. It's going to be life changing for some. When you start getting up into a hundred, uh, hundred sixty five thousand dollar bonus, right? Something you weren't uh, guaranteed you were going to get. It's going to get more women to stay in their career longer. Um, it's going to be able to put them in a financial position to, you know, for two hundred seventy thousand dollars in most countries, you can buy a house, you can buy your family a house. Um, or you can put a big chunk of money down so that you're not paying for that house for 30 years. Mm. So it's mm. life changing. All right, let's go to a lighter topic. I just laughed and smiled when I saw this stat about Chloe Kelly's penalty kick against Nigeria it was clocked in at 110, almost 111 miles kilometers per hour. That's powerful. It it's also, power. yeah, it was also the fastest or the, the hardest penalty kick of any penalty kick in the English Premier League last year. Wow. So women are, we're strong, we're powerful, we're 
tactical or technical, we're coming, right? If given the same opportunities and once we catch up to all the opportunities that the men have had, I think the game is played at a beautiful in a beautiful way, but it's also a physical, technical, tactical game. And on the right, further example, Alex Green, uh, Greenwood had an 89% pass completion rate during the World Cup. Uh, that's incredible. Now, she's playing at the back. She's playing on a good team. She's playing at the back. I don't know if it was through six or seven games, but I know she was a starter for them and played most, if not all, the games. And that pass completion percentage rate, because you want players to be secure at the back, for sure. But you also want them to take chances and to play some balls forward and penetrate. So that's a staggering number for us in, in the women's game. I think I also recall, Alex, and we talk about gender bias. We spoke about gender bias at the top of the presentation, April. I believe, and we don't always encourage this, but I believe she got a uh, maybe a head knock. Her, she was bleeding on the field. In we're, the used, we're used to seeing it um, strapped up. And to continue playing, it yep. maybe wouldn't be expected from a female athlete, but no difference. Straight yep. away, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stay on. I'm gonna compete. I'm gonna, I'm gonna fight for my country. So again, yep. it challenges the the notions of, of what we think to be true in terms of women's uh, women's sport. Yeah, that's right. You're in the World Cup final. Play on. If it's a flesh wound, if it's this near blood, keep going. <laughs> you know. Uh... All right, so I shared just a couple quick, you know, I thought this was a, a sponsor advertisement that was just clever, inclusive. We've got almost all the countries represented here. We got some name branding on the bottom and how our sponsors are, our sponsors, like the, like the video I showed at the beginning of this, are making a difference. They're helping the, the world accept women's football more. You're seeing that uh, women have uh, muscles you're seeing that they their feet are positioned properly you're seeing in this in this uh, poster that they're not objectified as being overly feminine <laughs> uh, but they are feminine too right and so um, I thought this poster as compared to a poster in 1991 which I will not show with you uh, this poster was more reflective of our times and our acceptance of women's sports here well I think it, it's a it's a long way from Brandy Chastain and the sports bra image, which was plastered across the world and was used as the uh, one of the signature images for women's football for so many years, is now being replaced, as you say, by these depictions of um, a more athletic um, and a more competitive uh, women's yeah. football. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I look here and I see uh, I see um, Sam Kerr doing a backflip, which she has traditionally done when she scores. I see here a Brazilian player. Uh, chest trapping, a Brazilian player jet, head juggling, right? You see uh, 18, I don't know who this is. Actually, I, I've got some funny, but you can see this player's foot is positioned properly. It's number 18 for England. Where's my mouse? Her foot is positioned properly for a side volley. This is the proper technique for a long ball, right? But this mm -hmm. is a really great depiction of women's sports. Here's another foot positioned properly for a side volley. So. And, I think, and I think that role modeling element was spoken to by Marta yeah. uh, in her final press conference around not having role models that she could relate to when she started yeah. her journey to now being a role model and inspiring her own teammates and future generations to come. It yeah. really does speak to that evolution. Yeah, it does. Yeah, I mean, I'd pay someone to put me on this poster with all these great athletes. <laughs> uh, all right, so just quickly, because I don't care about Instagram, but. These numbers are pretty powerful as well, right? They really are. They really are. There was a time uh, four years ago, I think, our, that Alex Morgan had more followers on Instagram than our entire men's team combined. Yeah. You know, you can see here Alexa Pateas, who's one of the best players in the world, two-time Ballon Dior winner, three million. So this is also, this kind of data is also getting sponsors on board on board for players to sponsor individual players but also for countries and we need that sponsorship money well it's that visibility isn't it april it's, mm -hmm. it's the visibility it that previously maybe not have been there and now it um now it is becoming mainstream and, and like you say the commercial benefits potentially to individuals and to yep. programs becomes more and more prominent it will yeah 
All right, and then we have our champion Spain. You know, um, I think it was a great message. Always when we get close to the finals, my people around me say, who do you want to win? Who do you want to win? Well, of course the US, if they're in the game and, and they deserve to win, right? But um, in the case of this game, um, we had a, uh, a female head coach who has become a star as a, a coach in women's football, has twice led her team to the European finals, has twice led her team to the uh, finals of the World Cup from two different countries. So I was cheering for her. But at the same time, when you watch Spain and the way Spain played um, and the beautiful collective um, technical, tactical, tight space, the way they deal with the ball in tight space, the way they can change. The goal they scored, if you go back and look at the goal they scored to win the World Cup, uh, Lucy Bronze from England was a white right back who dribbled inside, 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 got, got herself caught up on, on the mid-stripe, middle of the field, mid-stripe, lost possession. Oh, the Spanish players immediately. We're going to pick up this ball. They won the ball off of Lucy Bronze, Lucy Bronze, and they played it right behind where Lucy uh, left her space. That is brilliant. So that that wasn't coincidence. That was their tactical brilliance. So I was quite happy uh, that they won in the way that they won, in the way that they played. I think it's a great message. And um, it's also a great message for a country that um, I feel sometimes that uh, there's a lot of machismo still in some countries. Um, South America, maybe maybe in um, countries like, uh, I don't know, South Africa, maybe they're still not fully embracing women as great footballers, but in Spain, they, they have great men's football. They see that the women play exactly like them. And oh, by the way, Seamus, they won the under 17 World Cup. They've won the most recent under 20 Women's World Cup. And now they won the Women's World Cup. So it's a great message and it'll inspire more people to more people, more countries, more decision makers to step up and, and support women's football, particularly. So great message. You have any thoughts on the way they played in that game? It was it was an amazing spectacle. It really was. I I think as well to your point of having a program that has developed world champions at U17, at U19 and senior. It speaks to the alignment. It speaks to the emphasis and the focus on, on women's game and the, the work that goes in behind the scenes. Yes, I know they had their challenges. Um, I think we're all aware of those now. And I think it's amazing as well that a win like this can be a catalyst for change and to challenge some of those uh, topics that you were speaking about earlier in yeah. terms of making a real difference. I think success um, is a platform. It gives you a platform to speak to. Um, and it gives, I think, those that are aspiring to achieve greatness as well, those similar, uh, those similar aspirations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well said. And you tapped into something that as part of my work with FIFA, I travel around the world and um, we're messaging to our countries to, do you have a, a national style of play? Have you written it down? How do you plan to get out of the back? What's your, what's your build up plan or play out plan? What's your, how do you get through the midfield? What are your plans to develop players to be efficient in the final third? How are you defending? High block, mid block, low block, marking, whatever. On um, set pieces, is it zonal? Is it, right? It's clear in Spain there's a national philosophy in men's football and women's football. What a great model they are for the rest of the world. It, it, uh, the, the, those traits, are they also uh, traits that the national identity feeds into are the two very very different in, in a general perspective maybe not using spain as as the only example but those national traits that that people tend to have do they flow through into sport they do flow through into sport um some sometimes it's more apparent than others you're seeing uh, people that have followed the us for example for 30 years we've had a national style of play it's been relatively consistent it reflects our DNA, right? A little bit loud, a little bit aggressive, a little bit self-promoting, but powerful and technical and tactical and psychological in key moments and, and great competitors. Um, and you'll, you're starting to see that on the men's side in the US. German women reflect the German men, vice versa. Um, Brazilian men and women are very similar. They reflect their culture, a lot of flair, flamboyance on the ball and, you know, um, coming from playing street football. So 
you know, what I'm not is a proponent of there's only one style of play. There's many. Uh, what I'm a proponent of, especially in my job at FIFA, is to define it, write it, teach it, um, have somebody curate it over time and across ages, and that will improve your chances of success in FIFA's under 17, under 20 World Cup championships. And in specific to our Oceana viewers, to countries in Oceana, if you can get your country aligned, you're going to have a far better chance of um, having success and achievement and eventually moving up in those ranks. Just pausing there, is that applicable to club football as well, April? Can, can clubs also build that uh, DNA, as you call it? I don't know that in club football they call it DNA, right? Because it's not a national trait, so to speak. They're bringing national, internationals from all over. But in club football, it's clear. Uh, some of the best clubs have a playing style. Um, when I was growing up, I particularly liked uh, Man United and uh, Bayern Munich. And over the years, both of those clubs, they've had different coaches, um, a variety of coaches. They've had their ups and their downs, but their traits, their club passion, and their fan base hold their feet to the fire on playing a, a brand of football that's pretty similar over the years. Yeah. Hmm. Barcelona actually reflects their senior national team, right? Yeah. Uh, one could argue who, what came first, the Barcelona men's uh, style of play or the Spanish style of play. They, they would know. I don't know the answer, you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, but, oh, all right, let's move on. Sorry. Quickly, I want to mention, this, this slide reminds me to tell everyone that as fabulous as the 2023 FIFA Women's World Cup was in Australia and New Zealand, in terms of the quality of the games, the fan attendance, the stadium experience, the television coverage, uh, the fan support, the ultimate um, what teams advanced, which of the super teams, uh, traditionally strong countries didn't, the competitiveness, all of those things that happened and all the records broken. I just want to reflect back that one year ago, we had the same thing happen in Europe. Uh, England won the European Championships one year ago, a little over a year ago. And they broke attendance records. They had television records being broken. They have superstars. Their players now are superstars. A couple of them are, you know, the salaries that they're making. Their coach is a superstar, one of the first. There's been um, coaches before Serena Wigman that were very famous and um, great coaches in my mind. But I don't know that the media made them out to be stars the way that uh, Serena Wigman has, has elevated. So I share with you just quickly one slide from one year ago. So this is not, this Women's World Cup was not a one-off. They held the European Championships in England in I think, uh, what, eight stadiums. And in those eight stadiums, they now can say that the country, not ticket revenue, right? Not sponsorship revenue, as we were talking about earlier, Seamus, but the economic impact to the, to the eight cities that hosted the world, the uh, European Championships, 81 million euros was the economic impact for the community. And that's why I think women's football, again, we're seeing these kind of numbers happen in the U.S., but we have since 1999 seen these kind of numbers in the United States. We, we know that the United States is one of the leading nations in terms of having uh, our fans support us, our sponsors supporting us, our federation supporting us. But now we're seeing it in other countries. Last year, also in the European Championships, uh, not European Championships, in the Champions League, we saw 91,000 people attend a game in Spain. We saw uh, England play a friendly last year in Wembley, over 80,000 people attending. So all of this, if ever you were a doubter, um, I think there's enough data, there's more than enough data to knock you off the fence of doubting anymore about the power of women's football and that it's rising and to get on the get on the train, so to, so to speak. Not you, Seamus, because I know you are, but uh, get this. Let's get the decision makers in the game in Oceana on the train now. And of course, OFC is. We know that it's. Um, I think when I th when I make that statement, I think about uh, each of these countries. I, I travel around and they're like, oh, just women's football is not the same in my country. And it's like, you can make the difference. You, you can bring women's football to a new heights in your country. Um, get on that train and you will. You'll see the return on investment in your country 
um, here in this region will be quick. Okay, anything to add? Uh, no, I, I think you've painted an incredible picture of the global state of women's football, but I'm curious, are we able to drill down into what's happening here in our confederation in Oceania? Oh uh, yeah, let's flick to these others. I'll share a couple slides. Um, and hopefully some of the uh, the audience watching it'll resonate for them but let's let's share a few things about Oceania yeah so just a quick analysis um, that I hear that I believe in and I think what's great about women's football 100% of the male coaches that have coached men and move over to the women they say I love coaching these women they're open they're coachable they're try to implement what I what I suggest. It's rewarding. Um, it's not so egocentric, if you will. And so I think we that's just one of the many reasons why we have so much potential. We also see, as we've already talked about, setting new records, the beautiful game with very little investment. You can um, improve your women's team. I just flicked. Sorry. With very little investment, you can improve your women's team. Uh, very quickly, and your youth teams even quicker because younger players develop quicker. Some weaknesses, these are weaknesses where we have less money, less resources, less time, less touches, less professionalism. Imagine what will happen when we, when those words less are all turned into increased. I think we really will have some powerful influence. So this is data from the FIFA ecosystem analysis that we did back in June 2021. It was a global analysis. And what you can see here is, is, is uh, the, the average rank of men's teams in Oceania, uh, somewhere between 141 ranked FIFA ranking, 141 to looks like about 182 is their average ranking over the last 20 years. Again, with less resources, less opportunities, less touches, less contacts, look where uh, Oceania women are averaging in terms of their FIFA ranking. So with less of everything, the potential is rich in Oceania, I think. Feel free to stop me if anything mm. um, doesn't resonate, but that, that slide was pretty straightforward. Again, here in Oceania, you have the women's highest ranking was 22, the average ranking, the lowest ranking, and compared to the men, again, we don't try to pit the women against the men. We're just saying with very little resources and opportunities, look how well the women have done. So investing means your, your investment will turn around pretty quickly in women's football. Same with this bit on the right. I think it's great to be able to put these comparisons through and actually use data to back up the, the conversation. I think it's a really important point that, uh, that the, the feelings or the trends are able to be reflected in, in what the information is telling us at the same time. Yep. Yep. So if you want to make a, a difference in women's lives, start the women's football program, build on it, add to it, add coaching, find a better field, add equipment, find a sponsor, ask your country to contribute to the women's game. Your reward will be much faster than in men's football is my point. And we have the data. Um, here's some data very quickly on the, the senior World Cup. You can see here, whoops, sorry, that one went pretty quickly. The women's attendances, far fewer World Cups, but since 1970, the women have uh, attended more World Cups than the men. And the youth World Cups, these are pretty similar, by the way, um, which just tells you, I think, that uh, I've always said Solomon Islands, uh, Papua New Guinea, some of these countries in this region that um, are bubbling up, they are much more likely to win the Under-17 World Cup than they are the Senior World Cup. And so let's put some money towards their their uh, women's under 17 team and see see if they can knock off some giants and make it to the youth world cup. Just pausing there, what's the importance of international competition in, in terms of women's elite football development? Oh, well, first thing that comes to mind is when you travel abroad, it's hard. You're traveling through time zones. It's different food, different water, difficult to get food, difficult to get water sometimes. Um, you're uncomfortable. You're away from your family. 
Um, but you bind together as a team in a way that you did, wouldn't at home, right? You're now staying in the same hotel. You're eating three meals a day. You're doing recovery together. You're training together. And so it's a real team building bonding experience. I have uh, three friends in my life that I'm in contact with, a, with on a weekly basis. We all played together in the 1980s and on that 91 World Cup team. So their life friendships, if you will. So when you play internationally and you travel, there's stories to be told for decades. There's um, matching up the Solomon Island style as compared to say the New Zealand style or the Papua New Guinea as compared to Fiji style. So now there's that tactical adjustment you have to make. And um, different countries have different strengths, right? Back to the DNA question, why didn't, wasn't so sure DNA was the right word for club football, but it is for national team football. It's our nation and our heart and our pride against your nation and your heart and your pride. Oh, and also your technical, tactical abilities. So um, I think international football, you travel the world too. It's just a fabulous experience. When you get outside your bubble, you realize there's other people that um, have it more difficult than you do or other people that live differently or other cultures that are just simply different, no judgment uh, in any way, but they're just different. And um, I think it makes us a more holistic people as well. So I wouldn't change my travel uh, around the world for any experience, you know. Um, so many places I've been to, Seamus. Uh, we should move on. <laughs> yes. Yeah, let's. Okay. So quick, quick screen here I thought um, would be helpful to remind people that we're talking about changing people's lives. I am still in touch with my coach from the, who coached me from the age of 14 to 19. Um, he was very influential in my life. Um, he pushed me, he challenged me. I'm, I'm clear, clearly he made me better and off I went. And I think sports does that for girls. You know, you look here that um, after having participated in other sports, 70% 70, 70 of girls uh, that increased, they increased in their percentage once they had the opportunity. Um, after participating in sports, 87% of girls now know where to report any violence that happens or any uh, offense that happens. After playing sports, um, girls strongly agree that women should be able to earn their own money. And so culturally, socially, we're seeing the benefits and the far right one is easy. After playing sports, girls strongly agree 57% that I, I have skills and talents that I'm proud of. So instilling a sports can instill a sense of pride in, in women in, in uh, all over the world. But this is specific data coming from Oceana. My, my read on that, April, yep. is that sports just helps build confidence of young women. Yep. Confidence, agency independence physiologically we're healthier women that play sports are physiologically healthier physiologically more in control of our own body less pregnancy happens when we play sports um or pregnancy is delayed at least for uh, a couple years a uh, higher level of education when girls play sports so i think the social economic benefits are um pretty powerful What are the benefits? Oh, here's two more. So 97% of Pacific uh, girls say that they uh, playing sports makes them happy. So happiness. I didn't even mention happiness on the previous screen, but you can see these girls playing here look happy. And you can see 70% of girls in the Pacific are uh, insufficiently active. So it makes them happier, but they know that they're not active enough. So we've got to get more girls involved in any kind of sport. And I'll go back to my opening. I played basketball, ran track, played softball, and um, soccer. So any sports, we love it if you come to soccer, but um, I think any sort of activity is healthy. And just to wrap up my overall talk, I thought I would share. I, I know people on the uh, people watching this right now know that some of these players are playing abroad, but we're starting to see pro players 
from Oceana playing abroad. And this is really a first time ever. Um, I do not personally know these women. Emma Hayes from OFC, eh, Emma Hayes, uh, Emma Evans from OFC shared this with me. And I thought this was a, just a great story. We need to tell these women's story. Um, she's born here in 2000. So that makes her what, 23? She's off playing. She's already played in France, England, and Germany. Kiani. Uh, here from Fiji, she's already played in Israel and Puerto Rico. And hearing their stories and their lessons learned would be really great. And um, again, this player here is played from New Caledonia, is played in France. And then on the next slide I'll share, we've got a couple playing in the U.S. Um, they're out in playing for Orlando Pride, which the season is just starting to wrap up. So these women have gotten an opportunity from Fiji. And we talk so, about we talk about role modeling. We talk yeah. about visibility. Uh, nothing says I can do it like seeing people who are like you achieving those things on the world stage. So I think it's incredible uh, to see that progression of our own talent starting to come through to the global stage. Yeah, that's really well said, Seamus. If you can see it, you can be like it. You know, and that that's in. Being an athlete, a player, a woman, a role model for your children long term when you have kids. Um, it's being strong because life is long. And uh, if you can see more people doing the things that you're interested in doing, you're more likely to pursue it and achieve it. So, yeah, really well said. And, um, you know, sometimes the visions and the images we see don't look like us. And uh, that's including players being players and coaches and administrators and leaders and um, people in the position of board of directors and decision makers. So I'm hopeful that more women will pursue a career in football, that more women in Oceana will uh, play football, pursue a career, get involved in coaching, become a sports scientist, become a team administrator become a team leader, make their way through organizations, sport organizations, and become decision makers. So um, it's happening. I've seen it all uh, in my lifetime, but um, I think, uh, yeah, I just, let's celebrate these women when they do make these achievements. That's it. Seamus, do you want to pull it all together? You're, you're very eloquent. <laughs> no, I say I, I, thank you for asking me. Thank you to OFC for asking me to speak to you all and for having me here and for uh, Seamus, your, your um, ping ponging back and forth. So I'll let you have the last word, but thank you. I think, April, it's incredible that in our lifetime here in Oceania, we've been lucky enough to witness a World Cup and a World Cup which changed the face of the game. And I think to your point and to your remarks, uh, if you can see it, you can be it. And we have seen it. And there's an opportunity now for our football people to be it. And it's only through conversations with people like yourself who have a varied and wide range of experiences for people to think, well, if I can't be a player, maybe I can be a coach. If I can't be a coach, maybe I can be a physio. If I can't be a physio, maybe I can be an administrator. And that breadth of experience that you bring and uh, thank you as well for bringing that to our, our uh, participants, our coach participants, to have a real tangible link to the amazing experiences. And maybe just maybe there's something in there that they can take away and uh, implement at their own level, whatever that may be. So thank you very much for your time, for your wisdom. And uh, we look forward to seeing this great game continue to grow. Thank you, Seamus and OFC and them. Cheering for everyone. I look forward to seeing you all out there on the field.